This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome Parag Khanna to the show. He is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author. He is founder and managing partner of FutureMap, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. He has several great books, but the newest is The Future is Asian, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century. And before that, Connectography, Mapping the Future of Global Civilization. Parag, welcome. How are you? Very well. Nice to speak with you. Yep. It's good to have you on the show. So these are fascinating topics, especially in light of the international trade issues that we're all discussing nowadays. Talk to us a little bit about connectography first, if you would, kind of what the general premise of, of that book is. Absolutely. Well, that book came out a couple of years ago, but in my mind, and certainly based on what's happening in the world today, it's as relevant as ever. I argue that connectivity in the form of infrastructure like Everything from highways and railways to electricity grids and internet cables and satellites is really the most powerful force in human history. And whatever technological capability we have, we use. And we use it primarily to keep building more and more connectivity uh, around the world. So that is um, that was a book that really was about globalization and the future of globalization. Despite all the pessimism we have today about trade wars and so forth, Connectivity continues to be built all the time. You know, think about China's Belt and Road Initiative, building all these new infrastructures across Eurasia with six billion people. Think about new Internet cables being laid down every month. And that increasing volume of connectivity enables the next wave of globalization, which is both physical and digital. So really, that was a book about the dynamics of all of that connectivity and how it plays out both peacefully and competitively and especially how it elevates the role of cities in the world, cities and mega cities, kind of thriving urban metropolitan hubs, financial centers, and how really a great country is made up of great cities. So that, those are some of the arguments in the book. Mm-hmm. Dig a little deeper into the city component that you mentioned. Why cities? I mean, what do you mean when you say that? Uh, I mean, certainly we all know why cities are important and so forth, but what angle are, are you taking that from? I take it from a much deeper angle than most people. As you know, it's kind of a hot topic right now just to talk about cities and, you know, the world economy is based on cities, demographics is centered on cities. That's all true. But we have to remember something even deeper than that. Cities predate nations. They predate empires. They predate civilizations. Cities are really the oldest kind of, you know, social, uh, physical, societal construction that we have. We've had cities for 7,000 years. So it's very important to remember that empires can rise and fall. Countries are disappearing off the map all the time through civil war. But cities persist. Cities remain. So they are very important. Now we live in an age of the mega city, right, where truly cities are more important than countries. And again, as I said before, you can't even have a successful country without successful cities. And, you know, whereas for thousands of years, urbanization was an organic process. It just happens kind of voluntarily. Now it's become a strategic process where not only do countries consciously and even involuntarily drive people and allocate people into different cities, but we design them in advance with a purpose, like special economic zones, factory towns, ports. We build these from scratch, smart cities, as they're called, Songdo in South Korea, Google is doing one in uh, Arizona. We're retrofitting cities to add new districts to make them smart, like what Toronto is doing with Google and its waterfront and so forth. So cities have really become a very strategic, conscious, competitive enterprise, and nations get ahead by making their cities get ahead. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. We've all talked about globalization, of course, and we sort of all, all understand the rise of globalization, what it's done for to lift people around the world into or at least towards the middle class. But what is hyper globalization? You know, there's so many superlatives like hyper globalization and, you know, um, sort of, you know, unlimited globalization and so forth. And there's also the same in the opposite direction, like implosion, reversal, retrenchment, death of globalization. 
you know, I don't want to sort of grope for the thesaurus, you know, to make my point. But simply put, again, globalization is something that happens because of connectivity. We are building re- connectivity more relentlessly than ever in human history in every dimension, from sharing energy to sharing financial capital to sharing technology and data. So all of that globalization is happening more and more and more. And we haven't really seen anything yet, you might say. Remember that we're coming upon a period where soon pretty much every single human being in the world will have a mobile phone. We're going to have 5G around the world. So if you think that globalization is you know, nearing an end, you're basically crazy. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We've got this amazing world in which we live where we've got this almost frictionless global commerce, the ability to obtain information, products, sell products, services, whatever. It's it's truly an amazing time to be alive, as I always say. In the futurization, tell us about the premise of that book, if you would. So I wrote this book over the last couple of years, particularly having been based in Asia, and, um, you know, in order to demonstrate a few things. First of all, Asia is Asianizing. Asia is growing together. For 500 years, Asia has been divided by colonialism and the Cold War. And Asia stretches everywhere from the Arabian Peninsula all the way to Japan and from Russia to Australia. In other words, a very, very, very vast distance encompassing 5 billion people. And it's been 500 years since Asians had more to do with each other, had more dense relationships of commerce and diplomacy with each other than with Britain or America. And now that's happening again. And of course, no one alive today can remember when Asia was Asia, a full, not united whole, but an ever more integrating whole. And that's happening today. And it is truly the most exciting story in the entire world. So living here, I get to be in the heart of that action. And I'm writing, I've written this sort of reportage about it. And you're in in Singapore, right? I'm based in Singapore. And one of the critical things here is that Asia is more than just China. And for the last 20 years, we've had a lot of books about Asia. However, they've all actually been about China. Like of 400 pages, 395 are about China. What I've done in this book is to point out that Asia has 5 billion people and China has only 1.5 billion people. Therefore, there are 3.5 billion Asians who are not Chinese. Right. And pretty much, you know, no book is written about them together with China to paint an integrated and full holistic picture of Asia in which China has a big part, but it's not the only game in town. Mm -hmm. And that's exceptionally important because we are already moving towards a world where India, Southeast Asian countries are growing faster than China. They have younger populations. So investment is moving away from China into those countries. Southeast Asia, where Singapore is, has 700 million people. It has more, it receives more foreign investment than China itself does. So in so many ways, if you want to skate to where the puck is going, you know, to use that famous phrase right, from, from Wayne, Wayne Gretzky, Gretzky sure. you've got to be looking at the rest of Asia, not just China. Mm-hmm. And so, again, that story just has not been told. It isn't being told. And yet here we are in which that is the fact of the matter. Mm-hmm. So I really needed to tell that story and that that's what the book is about. And of course, the impact that it has on the rest of the world. What does it mean for us if we're in a trade war with China? What does it mean for the rest of the region? You know, a trade war doesn't have just two parties, right? Europe is a part of the U.S.-China trade war. Southeast Asia and India are a part of the U.S.-China trade war because trade is not about winners and losers. It's about substitution. It's about who wins or who benefits from someone else's loss, right? And it, it isn't necessarily the two players. It can be a third party or a fourth party. And that's what's happening right now. Again, I can tell you who's going to win the U.S.-China trade war. It's Southeast Asia, right, because of all that investment that's moving out of China. And I can tell you the ways in which it's good for certain American industries and bad for other American industries, right, because there's not just one national winner, but sub categories and industries that win or lose. So all of those dynamics. Before you move on, tell us about how it is for the American worker, though, because, you know, that's one of the the sales pitches is that, look, this is good for American workers. And I do believe as much as I want to be a free trader and, you know, embrace the libertarian ethic, that when the playing field is so 
unlevel in terms of wages, regulations, whether they be environmental or worker safety, OSHA type things. It's pretty hard to have straight open trade in that environment. Uh, although I, I love the idea of, you know, open trade and free trade, but can it work given the very different uh, burdens and, and yokes under which the, the different parties play? You know, is it even possible? Well, there's almost no such thing as, you know, straight up free open trade, right? And certainly not with Asia, right. where industrial policy and subsidies are the norm, you know, and we have to confront that. But in terms of the fate of the American worker, we have to go back to the 1960s and look at, you know, the increasing role of globalization and outsourcing that's hurt workers. We have to look at technology, which is hurting more workers than trade is, right? And this is just beyond any doubt has been demonstrated by tons of research. We want to blame China. We want to blame Mexico. Certainly Trump does. The fact is, and I, I, I implore all listeners of yours from whatever side of the spectrum they're on to understand this fact, you know, a lot more jobs are lost just because computers and robots can do the work instead of humans than trade. And even if you were to seal our borders and, you know, try and bring back all the jobs, Companies would give those jobs to robots, not to humans, right? So I just need everyone to understand that. So blaming others is not going to help. I will tell you what's bad news for the American worker. It's because of this trade war, China and other countries are going to say, hmm, maybe, you know, American goods are now more expensive and America didn't join the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement and America is an unreliable supplier because they don't want to sell us their high tech stuff. And, you know, we're having trouble stealing it from America. So what they're going to start doing is substituting America. Now, this is going to be really painful. We see we've seen this with soybeans, right? You know, if China is not going to buy American soybeans, it's going to buy them from Brazil and Argentina, right? Someone else wins. If they're not going to get semiconductors from Oracle or Intel, they're going to buy them from Japanese suppliers or German suppliers or Korean suppliers. Now, what happens two, three years from now when it's time for the 15 different Chinese airlines to procure their next round of airplanes? And they say, hmm, you know, we used to buy half our planes from Boeing and half our planes from Airbus. Now let's buy only 30 percent of our planes from Boeing and 70 percent from Airbus because the Europeans are being nice to us. You know, then we're really, really, really going to feel the pain, right? Because that's a lot of American workers who work for Boeing in all 50 states. So you got to be really, really careful when you play these trade wars and you think that you're, quote unquote, winning and you think that there's just one round to the game. These things go on forever, literally forever. That's why in connectography, I use the phrase tug of war. Tug of war is this ancient sport that this ritual really is human ritual. And a tug of war match can go on forever, right? It's a team that's heaving and hoeing for hours and hours and hours. And that's kind of what tug of war is in the trade world, except there's multiple teams and the rope goes in multiple directions, you know, and that's how complicated it gets. So Please don't believe anyone who tells you that anyone has won the war, right? It's going to morph and mutate and go in all sorts of different directions. But by and large, the biggest mistake you can make is to think that the stuff that you make is so unique that no one else can sell it. Because the law of technology diffusion is that even some of the most sensitive and wonderful inventions in the world, you know, that America invented are being caught up by others and others are starting to make them too. So it turns out that China only depends on America for a very small set of components. And even those, it can either now make itself or get from others. So we've got to be really careful and be more calculated about these things and not rhetorical. Okay, so fair enough, that's the set of components you talk about. But what about just the overall money, the consumer market, the size of that market? I mean, the U.S. is, is still by far the biggest. Of course, that dynamic is shifting over time. But right now, and for quite a few years, the U.S. has the biggest consumer market, right? Yeah, yes and no. So the U.S. is the largest economy in the world in U.S. dollar terms. But in purchasing power parity terms, which is a much more useful indicator of economic size because you price the goods and the currency that people actually buy them in, by that metric, which again is, is far more useful and, and, and way more economists use it now, uh, China is already the largest economy in the world. And our economy, the American economy, because it's 65, 70% based on consumption, a lot of those services are domestically bought and sold. So they're not really 
all that accessible in a way to foreigners. So in terms of the American consumer market yeah. being and, really and what, large, what, what you mean there is, you know, you can't export a haircut, right? That is that kind of bingo. Yeah. yeah, construction. Sure. Um, you know, even like legal services, a lot, a huge part of the American economy, right, is right. stuff that Americans buy and sell to other Americans. And there isn't really a lot of competition for those things because it's like, you know, like a haircut, right? Yeah. Or it could be university education, right, or something like right. that. So the slice of the American economy that's accessible to foreigners to sell their physical goods into or something like that is not nearly as large as you think it is. And in terms of economic forecasts, 90% of the consumption growth in that category is coming from the 5 billion people of Asia. It's not coming from the slow growing Europe. It's not coming from our sluggish economy, which is going to go into recession next year. And when it's you say our, Asia. you mean the U U U.S. economy, right? Right, yeah, right. Okay. So now what's happening is that, as I said, Asia is Asianizing. Asians are selling to other Asians rapidly, right? They're selling each other more mobile phones. They're selling each other more televisions. They're flying in planes to each other's countries as tourists more and more and more. But, and but, they're but, buying but, less okay, so, so, U.S. Okay, so let me, the US let, let me just, I want to just drill down on this because I think it's really important. First of all, I'd love to have you explain the purchasing power parity point because I think that is very important, as you mentioned. But also, this seems like this discussion kind of harkens back to Peter Schiff's theory from many years ago, not sure if you follow his work, about this decoupling that never happened. Because all of the stuff you said is completely accurate, but I don't know if there's one more major point we just talked about, just the overall size of the U.S. economy versus the Chinese economy versus the Indian economy versus, you know, the Eurozone. It's just bigger, right? <laughs> you know, it's just a giant economy. Of course, you can't export... Well, so the world economy. has... Yeah three giant economies. Mm -hmm. And let's just say that they're roughly, you know, relatively equal in size, especially in PPP terms. Mm -hmm. North America, especially the US is one of them, one pillar. Uh, let's say it's a third, right? Europe, the Eurozone is actually bigger than the US right. economy, sure. but let's just say it's a third. Yeah. And then Asia, right, is a third. So we are going to be in a multipolar economic world for a long time. Whether you're number one, number two, or number three if, is really doesn't matter for the purposes of this conversation if you're one-third, 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 right? So now let's take all of the Fortune 500 American companies, Coca-Cola, Boeing, General Electric, Google, you name it, right? Now, for the majority of American companies, they generate anywhere from you know 40 to 70 percent of their revenues from abroad. I mean, there is exceptions, but some of the you know biggest, most significant, largest employers and so forth. Globalization matters for them. It matters a lot, right? When Apple's sales decrease internationally, it affects the share price, right? Because even though Apple, you know, even though Americans still buy more Apple stuff than any other country, and there's more Apple stores in America than almost the rest of the world combined, that rest of the world combined is still a hell of a lot of iPhones and iPads and whatnot, right? right. Yeah. So if that number goes down because of the trade war, I don't know if you've seen the news, but just in the last few days, Chinese have been so angry about yeah. the Huawei the ban and the trade yeah. war. Sure. You know, they're smashing their iPhones in yeah. public on the streets and they're getting bribed to sign up for Huawei phones. As it is, <laughs> Huawei sells way more phones than Apple in China anyway. Right. Now, what that's going to do is that's got Carl Icahn and the activist investors in a frenzy that they were already in because they've been trying to short sell Apple for a long time. So Apple, you know, being the largest company in the world, it, this matters, right? The largest American company. It, it matters in the international dimension affects even uh, such a blue chip, steady, huge American company. It certainly affects lots and lots of others as well. Ideally, you're, do, you're big in America and the rest of the world, right? Why would we be talking right. either or? Yeah, right. It's not an either or. It's just you have a bunch of customers and hey, you, so know, you want got, the US as your customer. We've got and, global and American others. companies, global European companies, and global Chinese and Asian companies. And they're all competing at home and they're all competing abroad, right? Anything you do, that screws up your market share abroad, mm -hmm. where the competition is getting tougher and tougher and stiffer and stiffer, and they've got home field advantage, that's just not going to be good for you. Right. It's just not, right? Absolutely. I mean, even a third grader understands this. Yeah. So what we have to assess our policy against that yardstick, are we making it easier? And that's why, you know, even conservatives, 
even you know lots of Republicans, they regret that the Trump administration did not join the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. In fact, the very first thing Trump did, or maybe the very second executive order he signed when he came into the White House, was to pull the United States out of a trade agreement with Asian countries that the U.S. itself designed and created. And now, as of literally yesterday, that trade agreement went into effect and every other country decided to join it except us. So now Canadians will have more preferential access in Asian markets than we will, right? And so we've really got to appreciate that this is not about just winning and losing. It's about substitution. Sure, of course. Of course. It's not not an either or. I totally agree with you. Totally get it. But America, though, if you take the Peter Schiff decoupling statements from many years ago that so far didn't happen, but he said they would happen much sooner than they did. And, you know, we'll see what the future holds. We don't know yet. But America could decouple more easily than anybody else, right? Like if, yes. if if there was this decoupling, because the U.S. actually has its own middle-class consumer base and can sell things to its own consumers. So it's much more important that those other countries export than the U.S. export. And if the U.S. workers, Absolutely. in this whole trade war discussion, what bothers me about it, and I'm not even really taking a position, right? It just bothers me that... It seems like none of the news media is giving any credit to the Trump side in that American wages are finally going up after 40 years. It's insane that there's been no real dollar increase since 1977. I mean, of course, you can slice and dice stuff and, you know, say, well, yeah, but there's this and that. I know. I get it. But, you know, on on the macro sense, right, Americans really haven't had a real dollar raise in decades, okay? And, you know, no one's talking about how... There's just more jobs, better jobs. Wages are going up in the U.S. They're all just talking about how, you know, the prices of iPhones are going to go up. And that's true, but I don't know. You know, maybe it's worth it to have the price of... I mean, everything is so cheap, I can't even believe it when I shop for stuff nowadays. It is shocking. You know, I try to remember how life was in the 80s and the 90s. I'm old enough, right? And when I bought things then, things were really expensive. The world is awash in cheap goods I mean, maybe our expectations on on the price of things, they're just too high. Everything's well, the world dirt cheap. Is, the world is awash in cheap goods because yeah. a, because we outsource oh, the production of those goods to absolutely. Asia. Absolutely. I know why it we, is too. Yeah, I agree. If we nearshore them, if we nearshore them and we force them to be made at home, a mm-hmm. couple of things are going to happen. Let's again, let's use the iPhone okay. as the obvious yeah. example. So now they've said they're going to set up a factory in Texas. It happens to, by the way, be a partnership with Foxconn, who is their usual partner, which happens to be a Taiwanese company. Yep. Don't miss the irony in this. Right. Um, it's going to be mostly <laughs> it's going to be mostly automated, so it's not going to create that that many jobs. Mm-hmm. But here's the other thing: most iPhone components are made by Asian economies, like South Korea and Taiwan and Japan, and then they're assembled in China. Now, if you import those components you've just massively expanded your trade deficit, which is exactly what Trump is trying to close. So irony number one. Now, I'm with you on this, right? What you said is super important, uh, two levels. Number one, the United States uh, or North America as a continent is the most autarkic, self-sufficient continent in the world. We have all of the food, all of the fuel, all of the water, all of the people, all of the industry, and all of the technology to survive a world in which globalization disappears. No other part of the world can do that. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is geopolitically divine. It is what many people call the special providence, Mm -hmm. which is a beautiful term to capture a very fortuitous circumstance for which all Americans should be unbelievably grateful. Yes, they they, they definitely should. And not only that, we got these handy big oceans separating us. So the likelihood of being invaded is extremely low. (laughs) Exactly. All of that is wonderful. But now it works in several ways. It means that if you want to ship those iPhones and you want to sell them abroad, because we did establish that it is important to sell them abroad for your company to really have a high value and market cap, right? Right. It takes a long ass time, pardon my French, to ship those things across the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Huawei is making them in the factory next door to 25 major Chinese cities and selling them there. And by the way, they're investing massively and expanding their production in all the other fast-growing Asian economies. So they're going to outsell you 20 to 1, right? Mm -hmm. 
if you are not making them near your customers, which is why Dell does something very different, right? Dell makes its laptops as close to its customers as possible, and it too has a global customer base. Mm -hmm. It makes the laptops for Saudi Arabians in Saudi Arabia, it makes the laptops for Chinese in China, the laptops for Indians in India, and that's why it's doing well in those markets. It's close to its customers. Here's the other aspect of it that is a double-edged sword, immigration. Yes, wages are going up because labor markets are tight. A lot of it has to do with that, but also the fact that you know you have a skill shortage, right? So we don't have a demographic problem in the sense that, look, we've got plus 300 plus million people. Of course, there should be a job for everyone, but not everyone has the exact skills that are needed. So tech companies don't have tech workers. And since we don't have enough tech workers and we're not letting them in, you know what those companies are doing? It's not that they're not hiring. It's not that they're shutting down. It's not that they're shrinking. They're just expanding abroad. They're shifting jobs abroad. They're shifting entire offices abroad, right, to capitalize on those markets. You can't stop them from doing that. You shouldn't stop them from doing that because they're going to grow abroad, make more money, pay more taxes, bring more money home, and so on. It's a virtuous cycle. But when you cut off immigration, that's a mistake because we actually have a talent mismatch in the economy. So it's, it is OK to give Trump credit for certain things like the tax cut and the fiscal stimulus and the ways in which that's driving some amount of investment, creating jobs, reducing unemployment, wages going up. However, if the trade war also raises the cost of goods, makes things more expensive and you have inflation, while wages are not really skyrocketing, right? Let's not kid ourselves. We should be very glad that they're ticking up for the first time in decades, as you just said. But let's not pretend that suddenly we have, you know, some kind of German-like or Swedish-like salaries, right? We have nothing of the sort. So suddenly you're going to find that that's going to be damaging to the consumer economy and its health. So these things are just much more delicate than the bluntness of the conversation tends to suggest. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you. Well, look, at this is stuff, Parag, that we could talk about for three days. I love these topics. They're, they're, fa they're very fascinating. In your latest book, The Future is Asian, I think you're, you're absolutely right uh, in putting those economies together. And one of the interesting graphics that you show, you never really went into the PPP thing. Feel free to do that if you want to take a moment. But you do have a very interesting graphic in the book about that, showing the United States as number two to China. And with uh, when you look at it in terms of PPP at $18.57 trillion and China at uh, about $3 trillion higher than that at $21.42 trillion, India being third. Anything you want to say about that before we wrap it up? Again, this is now the new conventional wisdom, really, in terms of understanding the economic composition. You take a basket of, you know, everyday goods and you assess what people actually pay for those things. So, you know, a carton of milk and a DVD player cost a lot less in China in renminbi in their currency uh, than they do in U.S. dollars. So why would you pretend that you would calculate the GDP of that country based on what an American would pay for the same things in America? The Chinese person doesn't live in America, right? So it's actually a very obvious thing. And now that we have the statistical tools, it's not really that complicated to measure economies in PPV size. That's what we more and more do. And because, and this is the really the most important point here, China is not as trade dependent as we think it is. Its trade dependency has gone down. It's not as low as our trade dependency, again, because, again, we're very self-sufficient. But their trade dependency has fallen very, very drastically because they also – are a very large domestic consumer economy because they also are building a large middle class. And so they also are more cushioned from global trade wars much more than we think they are. So a lot of countries that we think of as being all about low wage labor, doing menial factory work, they can't survive without putting together widgets and sending them to us. They only make rubber duckies and Walkmen. Like that's kind of the old Asia, right? This book is about the new Asia in which services economies are more than 50% of GDP, just like they are in the US, you know, where mega cities and, you know, the consumer economy is thriving, flourishing, where it's not either or, but it's both and they have the factory work and the services work. It's not a trade off between retail and e commerce, they have booming shopping malls and booming online trade, right? All of those things are happening at the same time in this part of the world. When you come here, you see it, you feel it. And you realize that, to go back to the point you were raising earlier, there is a bit of decoupling going on. Decoupling, when it was articulated 10, 15 years ago, was undoubtedly premature. 
because it hadn't happened yet. I'm starting to see hints of it happening in a number of uh, sec- economic sectors when it comes to the availability of capital and liquidity and so forth. And so it's an idea that I actually do revive in this book and I explore it. I don't claim that we're moving to a world of you know islands that are detached and divorced from each other. But I am arguing that it's it's happening in certain areas more so than it did in the past. And it's something that we need to pay attention to. But most of all, to kind of come full circle, it really elevates the need to stay connected to those markets because they are drifting away from you in some categories. And if you want to be a big global company, you've got to make the extra effort to be connected to those areas. Otherwise, they actually will decouple. Right. Absolutely. Good stuff. Give out your website, Parag. Tell people where they can find you and all, all your great books. Paragkhanna.com, P-A-R-A-G-K-H-A-N-N-A.com. And the book and everything else is on that site as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us from Singapore today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.